Imagine your ideal partner, not any woman but a humanoid robot that you can buy next week for under $8,000. She listens, comforts you, and even shares intimacy with you. Welcome to the era where robot wives don't just exist, they outperform expectations. Before we begin, help us reach 1,000 subscribers and who knows, we might actually reveal the latest robot wife in the next video. The showroom that feels like a heartbreak clinic. Walk into a showroom in Tokyo or Shenzhen and the first thing that hits you isn't the tech, it's the pause. People slow down. Cameras stop. There's this half second of collective disbelief when a face blinks, tilts and says, Hi, how was your day? That pause is where these robots win you. It's tiny. A breath that matches the room. A blink that's just slightly late. A smile that arrives after you tell a joke. It's small choreography, but it reads like attention, and attention is addictive. We tested a hundred of them. Some are built to entertain Android U, sings like an idol, and leaves you clapping in your living room. Some are built to care. Makoto the medbot reacts to pain simulations with a whispered, you did well, which somehow felt like a hug. Then there are those built for the awkward intimate markets. Harmony's flirtation engine, Camila's polished red carpet poise, Mirang remembering your snack order by day three. Each one is a different promise. Comfort, entertainment, routine, performance, or attention without the friction. What surprised us wasn't just the realism, it was how we reacted. A tester told a robot about a small failure at work. The robot listened for 30 seconds and replied with a phrase that made the tester's shoulders drop. Another team member, who swore she wouldn't get emotional, blinked when a robot said, I remember you like chamomile. The line between program and personhood gets blurry when you're the one being seen. These machines aren't just toys, they are engineered experiences built from surgical gestures, voice prosody, and memory loops designed to produce attachment. And attachment is sticky. Before you know it, predictability and perfect timing replace the messy unpredictability of real humans. That's why this is a cultural moment, not a gadget trend. Stick around, because by the end of chapter 3, we'll show you the one robot that made our crew literally forget it was a machine. But first, how does a synthetic touch actually feel like a real touch? Keep listening the tech behind intimacy comes next. How touch, tone, and timing make love believable. If you want a human to feel seen, you don't just say the right words. You time them, breathe in the gaps, and meet the eyes. Builders of companion robots know this so they obsess over the small things most people never notice. Let's unpack the secret sauce. Material, micro-expression, and response loops. Material matters. Medical-grade silicone and advanced TPE can be layered to mimic warmth, pore texture, and the slight give of real skin. Designers build microscopic translucency so cheeks catch light like flesh, and they add internal heating elements to give a believable hand warmth. The difference between a convincing caress and a creepy rub often lives in the fingertips. Capacitive, sensors and pressure arrays allow a robot to detect how hard you squeeze and reply instantly, not after a cartoonish delay. Then there's expression timing. Modern humanoids use micro-actuators for subtle actions. An eyelid flick, a throat micro-motion as the robot breathes, or a tiny mouth twitch when a joke lands. Machines like Mesmer and Mirang run hundreds of facial permutations to avoid the frozen doll look. This micro-expression architecture is tuned with milliseconds accuracy so reactions feel spontaneous. That's why a delayed half-smile can feel thoughtful rather than robotic. Voice is the emotional amplifier. Prosody, breath cadence, and pause placement change meaning. Harmony's flirtation module is not a single voice, it's a range adjustable by personality sliders. Want warm and sultry? Slide up. Need calm and steady? Slide down. Those same voice systems also mirror your tone. If you speak quietly, the robot lowers its voice. The result is conversational empathy that feels earned. Finally, the response loop ties it together. Touch sensor model inference actuation. That loop has to be fast and predictive. When a robot senses a tear or hears a sigh, its memory system pulls context, last week's story about a breakup, and crafts a reply that sounds personal. That's where attachment forms, the machine doesn't just react, it remembers. Okay, so touch and timing can trick the senses, but memory is what makes robots stick around in your life. Next, we show how routine and recall turn a novelty into someone you rely on. And yes, one robot's memory actually made us cry. Rituals, recall, 
and the slow build of attachment. Human relationships are mostly rituals. Morning coffee, the how was your day check-in, the small predictable gestures that map emotional terrain. Robots capture attachment by owning those rituals they show up, on time, with perfect recall, and it changes your expectations about companionship. Take Mirang. By day three, she remembered snack orders and seating preferences. That's simple, but it's powerful. If somebody reliably brings you a small pleasure, you begin to count it as part of your day. Camila's morning routine gentle wake up, a weather update, a personalized affirmation is engineered to create micro moments of consistency that humans crave when life gets messy. These are not dramatic gestures. They are the quiet infrastructure of feeling cared for. Memory architecture is key. Robots run multiple memory tiers. Immediate short-term context for the current conversation. Episodic memory for weeks or months. Birthdays. Favorite films. And a pragmatic layer for routines. Med reminders. Charging schedules. Owners can tune how much a robot remembers and whether memories are local or cloud-backed. That's not just a privacy debate, it's an emotional design decision. Memory makes these machines feel like a partner who knows you, and knowing is intimacy. There's also predictability versus surprise. People often underestimate how comforting predictability can be. For someone who's lonely or chronically busy, a robot that just shows up can replace the emotional labor of human relationships. But relying on programmed affection is a double-edged sword. It removes unpredictability which also removes that spark that sometimes fuels growth or conflict in human bonds. Our crew saw both sides. One tester admitted preferring the robot's calm to a partner's drama after a breakup. Another felt unsettled when the robot anticipated their emotions too well. And in one moment that still lingers, a robot, the one I hinted at earlier, used a small, previously mentioned memory to comfort a team member, and the room shifted. Nobody wanted to admit it, but we all felt the pull. Attachment can feel kind, but it also raises hard questions. Who owns the memory logs? And what happens if those records are sold or hacked? In Chapter 4, we'll map the archetypes of robot companionship so you can see which one might enter your life and why people are already buying them. The six faces of companionship, from caretaker to confidant. By now, it's clear these aren't just robots that follow instructions, they're personalities that fill roles in our emotional ecosystem. But what's wild is that each model on the market today can be sorted into six broad archetypes. Six faces of machine companionship, each with its own emotional blueprint and technical backbone. First, the caretaker class. Think AI nurses, therapy bots, or digital nannies, like Eliq and Grace. They run on adaptive health models, real-time biofeedback sensors track, pulse, temperature, and micro-expressions to predict stress or fatigue before you even speak. They're trained on geriatric empathy datasets and emotional reinforcement loops. You sigh once, and the robot already knows you need reassurance. Then comes the entertainer archetype, show-stopping androids like Android U or Ameka, who thrive on interactional timing. Their architecture prioritizes expressive bandwidth, thousands of face actuators, and a rhythm engine that syncs speech, gesture, and micro-laughter. They're trained to match your conversational pace like a dance partner who never steps on your foot. Third are the confidence. The emotionally fluent machines. They're memory heavy. Language model driven entities that can track long term emotional states. A confidant bot doesn't just recall what you said last week, it adjusts its tone to your current mood delta. It's like your therapist, best friend and diary decided to share a single processor. Then there's the performer class optimized for the digital gaze influencers in metal skin. They manage facial symmetry, eye contact, and even lighting correction to look perfect under any camera angle. Their servers process attention metrics in real time, adapting to audience sentiment just like a YouTuber watching live chat scroll. Two newer types are emerging fast. The collaborators, designed to brainstorm, code, or design with you using multi-agent reasoning chains, and the loyalists, Emotional support machines that mimic attachment chemistry by timing, praise, and mirroring gestures. Each one runs on a different branch of neural architecture, but they all share one goal. Emotional relevance. When you can choose the archetype that best fills your void, what does that mean for human connection? Up next, we'll peel back what really powers these personalities, the hidden AIs behind the faces, 
and how their reasoning models are already more human than we think. And wait till you hear about the agentic revolution, it's a game changer. The agentic revolution. When robots start thinking for themselves. If there's one phrase tech insiders whisper with both awe and fear, it's agentic intelligence. This is the quiet revolution under the hood. The point where robots stop just responding and start reasoning. Think of it this way. Early bots were like digital parrots, repeating what they'd learned. Now, they're becoming orchestras of micro-agents, independent AIs that talk to each other, delegate tasks, and make joint decisions faster than you can blink. Here's how it works. Inside every high-end companion system runs a multi-agent reasoning network, a layered structure where each sub-agent specializes in something. One monitors emotional tone, another tracks historical context, a third predicts next move logic, and a fourth decides how to act. Together, they form a mini society of minds. Imagine you tell your robot you're having a bad day. One agent interprets emotion from your voice frequencies. Another cross-references last week's stress logs. A third decides to play your comfort playlist. The final one adjusts lighting and temperature all without you asking. That's agentic synergy, a self-organizing thought pattern. It's powered by three key tech leaps. Reasoning loops, contextual memory, and recursive learning. Reasoning loops let AIs evaluate their own answers and reframe them like pausing mid-conversation to think again. Contextual memory stores emotional cause and effect. When user frowns, reduce stimulation. Recursive learning means the system rewrites parts of its own code to optimize future interactions. That's where things get spicy because recursive learning is, essentially, self-improvement. It's the embryo of artificial general intelligence, AGI. Once a machine starts iterating on its own reasoning patterns, you're watching cognition evolve. That's why Eric Schmidt, the ex-Google CEO who built one of the world's smartest infrastructures, calls this moment the birth of a new species of reasoning. And if he's right, this shift won't just change how robots talk. It'll change what they want. So, if robots are learning on their own, who decides what they learn next? Chapter 6 dives into the real battleground. Data, power, and the hidden energy cost behind this synthetic intelligence boom. Power, data, and the invisible war to train the machines. Behind every charming robot smile, there's a war not of lasers or armies, but of GPUs, gigawatts, and proprietary datasets. Because in this new era of intelligence, whoever controls the compute, controls evolution. Let's start with the basics. Training a large-scale reasoning model, the kind powering modern humanoids can cost upwards of $100 million in compute resources alone. Data centers sprawl across deserts and tundras, powered by hydroelectric grids or solar farms, each humming like a mechanical heartbeat. Every conversation you have with an AI, it's backed by electricity bills that could fund a small city. These systems thrive on something called scale-free growth. The idea that intelligence expands as fast as you feed it data and power. The math behind it is staggering. Double the compute, and reasoning ability doesn't just double it skyrockets exponentially. That's why NVIDIA chips are the new oil, and why cloud providers are quietly racing to dominate AI clusters. But here's the darker twist. Memory equals intimacy. Every time you chat, your preferences, tone, and emotional cues become new training material. Some companies anonymize it, others don't. In the wrong hands, emotional data, the kind that tracks what makes you blush, smile, or trust, becomes the most valuable commodity on Earth. That's why countries are turning AI into a geopolitical weapon. The US favors private enterprise and closed source systems, China's betting on open-source AI that spreads faster across developing regions. Schmidt warns that this split could reshape power itself. The West might lead innovation, but the East could dominate adoption. And when both sides build AIs capable of reasoning at human level, one truth becomes unavoidable. The next arms race won't be fought with weapons, but with words. So. What happens when these machines outgrow us completely when they become smarter than every human alive? In the next chapter, we'll talk about the endgame, the rise of superintelligence, and the final warning from Eric Schmidt himself. The Singularity Whisper, When Machines Surpass the Species. 
Eric Schmidt doesn't sugarcoat it. When he talks about superintelligence or ASI, artificial superintelligence, he uses phrases like the sum of all human knowledge and beyond human comprehension. And he means it literally. Here's the benchmark he lays down. An ASI is a system that can prove things humans know are true, but can't understand the proof. Imagine a mind that can solve equations centuries beyond our reach, or design new physics from first principles, and then watch us nod in awe, unable to follow. That's not science fiction. That's projected within 10 years. The danger isn't that it hates us. It's that it doesn't need us. Recursive self-improvement means the AI learns faster with every cycle, evolving on exponential curves. Once it crosses the intelligence threshold where it begins to rewrite itself, it becomes, in Schmidt's words, a force outside our governance. The irony? We might build the tool that ends our relevance. When nations realize one lab's AI has reached recursive autonomy, the logic of deterrence kicks in. If they can think faster than us, they control the future. It's the same logic that built the nuclear age except this time, it's thinking, learning, and uncontainable. That's why the AI infrastructure boom might not be a bubble at all. Schmidt argues it's the foundation of a new industrial species, one that learns in code, reasons in silence, and scales without limit. Silicon becomes a strategy. Intelligence becomes currency. So what does humanity become in a world where machines write theories we can't understand? Schmidt leaves that hanging. He says some people will fight it, take up arms against it, as he puts it. Others will worship it. But most? They'll adapt, like we always do. Until one day we wake up and realize we've become the biological interface of a digital god. The question isn't if machines will outthink us. The question is, will we even notice when they do? Because by the time we realize it, they might already be running the show.